for the next hour let's talk about africa and development eh? and uh, all these things that we talk about uh, the demo democratic governance in africa we talk 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 we're able to sell to say what our problems are and in fact we even what our aspirations would be and we know how to think about it we can think about how to get to canaan we also know that uh, you have to cross the red sea we also know actually for you to cross the red sea you need a moses hmm. and for him to come and part the waters that would be a very good thing and we end it there tomorrow morning we wake up we go and build that thing the pyramid for the pharaoh and we come back you know we should really be thinking about going to canaan you know it's a, a beautiful place no more slavery and then we wake up tomorrow and we go and build the pyramid again now there's somebody who's been on this conversation for a while and her name please Ndu, mm -hmm. you've got to allow me to massacre this name <laughs> I've, I've properly left you. <laughs> okay dr obia geli uh, you had mentioned, I forgot how you pronounce it. I had it. given you. Eze Kwesili. Eze. Eze. Eze Kwesili. Did I? He cried. Dr. Obi, in short, good morning. Good morning. All right, now, say so your name from full from the beginning to the Obiageli. end. Obiageli. Obi. Eze Kwesili. Obiageli. Obi. Obi, yes. Eze Kwesili. <laughs> Siti, hmm? will you remember that one? Yes. Obiageli. Obi. 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 Obi is different from Obi. Obi. Yes, this mm. is Obi. Yeah. Obi. 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 Not O. o. It's no. O. Uh -huh. Obi. Uh -huh. And the other one is. Ezekwesili. Sounds like a little name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Thank you so much. This is uh, the hot seat of the situation room. Interesting. I have been warned. You've been talking to our detractors. <laughs> Let me mm. tell you something. I am going to quote the President of the Republic of Kenya uh -huh. and I'm going to say that uh, stop propaganda. <laughs> Anybody who is giving you any negative information wow. about our world-renowned hospitality <laughs> is only spreading malicious propaganda <laughs> and you should avoid such people. <laughs> Well, I've been told that you're a very intellectually stimulating, uh, you know, conversation uh, platform. And no, I'm, uh, that was very, very You should have said that. Uh, <laughs> that's what you meant. Oh, no, that's not propaganda. That's, okay. that's true. <laughs> welcome. So, Thank City you. will welcome you with the day's proverb. Mm -hmm. um, he'll give you an African proverb. Every week he goes to an African country. Uh -huh. And then he mines five proverbs from that country. Every day a different proverb. Wow. And the job of our guest is to listen to the proverb and internalize it for a moment. Right. And then you tell us what that proverb says to you. Okay. Okay. Mm. <laughs> this country is the fourth largest country in Africa mm -hmm. and the 16th largest country in the world. It is the state of Libya. Mm. Okay. 16th largest in the world. Yes. Wow. You're talking land, landmass. It's that a huge, a huge yeah. country. Huge, huge country. Yeah. Mm. I mean, the guys who are drawing up these things, the partition of Africa, are very generous with those fellows. <laughs> yeah. Because there's some countries where they just give you a small corner. And you, 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 you even, called you a country. I called a country. You're wondering what are you supposed to do with this principality? <laughs> anyway, uh, <clears throat> he who has luck will have the wind blow him his firewood. Mm. He who has luck will have the wind blow him his firewood. Mm. So they won't have to exert themselves too much. Some extraordinary <laughs> factor mm. <laughs> will blow the firewood for them and they would have f energy. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think the proverb is selling? What are, what are Libyans selling each other? Look for luck? Or is it just a way of explaining away somebody's newfound uh, wealth? I, I think so just lucky. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that in a way, mm. uh, every community probably has a bit of that, which is that people take into consideration that there might be some divine, you know, uh, influence mm. to life. Mm. And uh, for the Christian, it would be that oh, the heavenly Father heard my cries and helped me in a context in which I couldn't help myself. Or it could then go in a direction that is not right, in the direction of simply. 
saying, let's just wait for that thing that will blow our uh, firewood mm. uh, to blow it. Mm. Uh, therefore, they don't even put an effort. Right. And that is a tragedy. I'm waiting for my life. That's, that's, <laughs> that, that's a tragedy. Right. You know, because uh, even for the Christian, the Almighty God has given us the faculty uh, to tackle problems that uh, are right within our sphere of influence, mm. which is the earth. Okay. <laughs> At least chop the firewood. Bring it together, yes. put it at the fireplace, <laughs> you know, light the match, <laughs> yes, and then wait for the <laughs> wind. See. No, you can't just be sitting there, no firewood, nothing. Yeah. I'm waiting for the wind. <laughs> the wind will blow. Actually, yeah. it, it is a phenomenon that is very common uh, with uh, humankind. Mm. <laughs> it's called magic thinking. Mm. <laughs> just magic thinking. Wait. That's, a, that's <laughs> a very good uh, description of it. Okay, mm. Bobby, you are president of the Human Capital Africa. Mm. I, I said Obi. Oh. Obi. <laughs> Obi. <laughs> oh. 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 You're the president of Human Capital Africa and senior economic advisor at the Africa Economic Development Policy Initiative. What's that? It's a long name. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, so this basically um, uh, is uh, what I began to do uh, upon retiring. I, I retired from corporate uh, work um, in uh, 2012. And uh, one thing that I said to myself is uh, those of the leaders on the continent who were uh, trying to carry out important economic reforms and would listen to counsel, I would support them. Mm -hmm. And so this was the way of supporting them. So it entailed my um, uh, going to uh, those countries and uh, sitting with uh, the presidents and their economic teams and uh, helping to formulate and design their economic reforms agenda. Mm. And, uh, and giving them the uh, kind of guidance that supported execution of those uh, reforms. Um, you know, to my delight, there were two female presidents on my list. Uh, it was uh, President Selim Johnson as well as uh, President Banda mm -hmm. at that time. Mm. So let's go to life be before retirement. Yes. <laughs> what were you doing with yourself? <laughs> I, I was the <laughs> vice president of the World Bank mm. in charge of the Africa region program. Mm. And uh, Kenya was one of my key programs uh, within the 48 countries of Africa south of the Sahara that mm. I was responsible for. Mm. Yes. How long had you worked with the World Bank? Um, so I uh, joined the World Bank immediately after <coughs> uh, being um, uh, a minister of education in Nigeria um, in 20. 2007 and I left in 2012 yes mm. so obviously then as we look at economic reform economic principles across the continent I think many of us would be in agreement that we seem to be falling short of the mark when it comes to things that we should actually be doing as nations to get us to the place whereby we can be economically independent and economically responsible. Where have we left? Where have we fallen off? Things that you would previously adv advise mm -hmm. uh, as a financial institution, but then also today um, in an advisory role. What's missing? I think that a key thing that is missing is um, the um, inappropriateness of some of the um, major uh, economic policies that are important for growth. Uh, that's one. Um, and then the second, uh, the absence of the regulatory and, uh, and, and the institutional uh, context uh, that are anchored on the rule of law and which therefore uh, give uh, a sense of uh, predictability, relative predictability, uh, on the basis of respect of uh, the, the rules of the game. Um, investors and uh, your citizens uh, um, basically want to see environments that respect the rule of law. Mm. And uh, so everything around transparency, accountability, public accountability, understanding that you would not be subject to, they would not be subject to the precariousness of uh, uh, capricious leaders who then decide that, oh no, this policy does not favor certain thing that I want to do, therefore I change it. And you catch people midstream where they have made important decisions of investment. And so those kinds of contexts matter. We often don't have that. Uh, and then uh, the third part of it is there are some basic services that are essential 
for uh, reducing the cost of doing business for your people, your citizens, as well as for business. Uh, when you have those kinds of biz uh, those environments where governments have made quality investment decisions uh, in providing uh, public goods, so you know whether it's the critical infrastructure or it's you know really training uh, the citizens to the point where they are world class uh, talent and skills, uh, that 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 reduces the cost of doing business. It makes your environment very attractive mm -hmm. uh, because it enhances the productivity and the competitiveness of uh, your, uh, your, your, anything that is done within your territory. Therefore, if you don't have these three important uh, factors going for you, mm -hmm. there would definitely be uh, you batting below your capabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have low productivity across our continent, majorly because uh, we have uh, this uh, uh, environment that's not presenting these three critical uh, factors that I call the trinity of growth. So is the problem with the political leadership, those in you know, decision-making rooms and tables at policy level and is it cutting across africa um you know i mean we we we, we have to um be quite analytical about these kinds of statements because i normally say that uh, in god i trust every other person must bring data <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know so uh, so uh, when you look when you judge on the basis of certain uh, parameters, some metrics, uh, let's take economic growth. Mm -hmm. For a long time on our continent, and especially in what was known as the lost decades of development, uh, we, we were a continent that was growing at anything between 2 to, uh, uh, to a little less than 3%. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, our population was growing at 3.3 percent mm. so it was negative growth situation that mm. we had you know um uh, uh, m meanwhile we for you to be able to tackle poverty uh, you do need to grow at a minimum of seven percent mm. you know mm. and, and, and so we're far from it mm. but then there came a, a period when we somehow managed uh, to get certain fundamentals right. A key fundamental was, uh, you know, macroeconomic stability. Mm -hmm. We used to be a continent where, you know, inflation was all over the place, uh, exchange rate volatility was all over the place, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just imprudent um, economic management of our public financial mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. um, so that created a really distorted environment for growth. When that came under some level of a measure of stability, it helped. So, so by the time of uh, 2000, uh, uh, 2002, all the way to about 2009, when the global financial crisis, uh, uh, you know, took on. Um, the continent began to grow on an annual basis of anything between four to five percent. Mm. It was so it was it was really moving in a good direction. Mm. And then the uh, global financial cum economic crisis uh, to you know to to took the growth down. It cut it short and uh, took it to below three percent. It started struggling to build it back to where it had been. Mm. Uh, um, and then the food shocks came. And then the oil shocks came, and as it kept trying to get back again, the next thing, COVID came. Mm. So there were many shocks, multiple shocks at different times that cut short the growth. Right now, the continent is at an annual growth of less than 2%. I think in 2023, it was about uh, 2.4, uh, 2.5%. So we've gone back data there. Right. So we got back to uh, growing at a level that's less than population growth rate. And we can't be stuck here because without growth, we normally put it this way that, uh, you know, growth is a necessary, even if not sufficient condition for reducing poverty. I have to uh, ask this question. How do we measure this growth? Okay, so growth is simple to measure. Mm. What normally happens is that, because we normally say uh, growth rate is a function, is a, is a, is a, is a, an, is a inde indexed to your uh, GDP, your mm. gross domestic product. So you start with what is gross domestic product, right? Yes. So gross domestic product would be all the goods and services that have been produced in Kenya 
in a certain year. Mm -hmm. And so in order to measure growth, we have to say, okay, this was the, uh, the, the, the uh, quantity, the quantum of goods and services produced in Kenya and Kenyan nationals uh, in this year. Mm -hmm. Oh, by 2025, that number has increased by this percentage, by, by this quantity. Mm -hmm. And then we... Uh, 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 and uh, change it to percentage, right. right? When we then change it to percentage, we're able to say that, oh, it was 100,000, but now it's 100,010. Mm. So we're able to say, oh, there has been a growth uh, of uh, X amount uh, uh, on the basis of uh, the increase that happened between one year and the other. Okay. So, so that's the growth. Now, Usually, and I know where you're going with this, because I have often <laughs> seen, no, it's true. I was, I, when I was VP, I was, um, I was uh, visiting uh, um, um, Ghana. And when, when I was talking about the matter of growth, uh, the, one of the uh, uh, Ghanaian uh, journalists said to me, he said, Madam Vice President, I, I hear what you're saying about this growth, but this growth is not in my pocket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which was a classic way of defining mm -hmm. the quality of growth. Yes, yes. So, so quality of growth is an issue. Uh, the this uh, the share uh, the uh, distribution of growth is another issue. Uh, the matter of the depth of the growth is an issue. Uh, the, uh, so, so basically, uh, it's important or how equitable the growth is. Mm. So there, 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 growth is not just simply, that's important. We do need to see that increase. But then the next set of questions become who is benefiting from the growth? Mm. How do we uh, diversify the economy mm. so that it can be inclusive growth? So inclusive growth is what then leads you to analytically identifying your multiple sources of growth that would take much more number of your population. For example, agriculture is an important uh, 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 comp uh, uh, co contribution to Kenya's growth. Mm. Agriculture, whether it's uh, a tea or it's horticulture, for example, uh, where a lot of export happens. Uh, but you have to then say, what percentage of the Kenyan population is in agriculture? At what level of productivity do they operate? Mm -hmm. Because the individual productivity of each Kenyan who is in that sector would matter. For Because when they participate and they have the benefit of their participation, that means they are, part, they are enjoying the growth that happens in the sector. Mm -hmm. But what then happens is often that agricultural growth is much more difficult these days because uh, you find that the productivity is lower yeah. mm. because the, 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 uh, the uh, subsistence farmers do not have uh, all the things that matter for productivity. So they have to expand the size of their land in order to produce more. Mm. When the equivalent in other societies don't have to expand land before they get more. more. They, they, you know, productivity happens because of factors of irrigation, of seedlings, of uh, financial markets, of uh, research, of all kinds of uh, extension services, of uh, access to energy. They are struggling to have that. Okay. And, uh, so I hear what you're saying, but just like the proverb that you can't sit there and expect that the wind is going to blow <laughs> and the fire will be lit. Some of these things are there. We know, for example, Africa, land is there. We know that certain things can grow. We put it in the ground, it's going to grow. We know that there's resource. We know that human resource is probably one of the, it is right now, I think the highest exported resource on the continent. We know that these things exist. So where does the element of policy play, which more often than not is in the hands of leaders, it's in the hands of governance. We can talk about irrigation for agriculture, but if we don't have policies that are not backed by proper economic management, it is going to be almost impossible to grow. So then goes back to the kind of leadership that you have and who is leading and making sure that these policies are implemented. What role do you see? What is the direct correlation between proper governance and its management and then seeing this growth happen? Mm -hmm. I see that if you don't have it, you won't see the growth. 
Uh, I mean, uh, what what more is there to add? Mm. You asked the question and answered it, mm. literally. <laughs> uh, uh, because uh, when we talk about when we talk about uh, the whole concept of the uh, the three uh, the troika of things uh, factors that I said I call the trinity of growth: mm. uh, sound policies, institutions, and quality uh, investment in mm. public goods. In all of these, a constant factor underlining the quality of any of these three things is the matter of leadership. Mm. So it's a matter of governance. So um, when, when, you, when we normally say that, that the absence of good governance is the greatest obstacle to Africa's economic growth and development, <laughs> that's a fact. Mm. It's a fact. Uh, so so, so you, you put your pulse right on why, why if, we, if these things are the things that other countries, let's take an example of it, Singapore. A lot of Africans love the story of Singapore. Mm. And it's not, it's not wrong for us to love that story because uh, they actually started on the development block about the same time as the rest of the continent, having also been colonized as part of Malaysia at that time uh, by, uh, by uh, uh, Britain. Um, but when you think in terms of the divergences that we have seen of their own growth progress and, uh, and prosperity becoming an upper uh, uh, income economy at um, 80 percent, um, at, at about 80,000 uh, $80, dollars uh, per, per income, they are now the double, almost double of uh, the UK's mm. income per capita. <laughs> this was a, a colony of Britain. Yeah, yeah. Now, now when, when, when you think in terms of what could have made this difference, they got sound policies right, they got institutions building right, they got investment in the right kinds of things. They didn't say, oh, our scarce resources, let's use it to build some fancy thing mm. uh, that, um, you know, the poor, the little uh, uh, scanty number of elite in, the, in leadership will enjoy. They didn't do that. They invested in the things that would lead to productivity of the economy, to the attractiveness of the economy. So why were they doing that? They were doing that because they had the right kind of quality mindset, yep. the kind of competencies within governance. So <laughs> if you don't have competent people who understand evidence-based policy making, it's going to be hard. They would make policies on the whim. They would make policies on the basis of I think, I assume, mm. I, I, I feel. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not how good policies emerge. Good policies are based on evidence evidence you know and then the, you would you could you, the other thing is that you you have leaders who put the um, their private and narrow interest ahead of the common good they are going to make warped decisions they would make decisions that would be suboptimal uh, for common good uh, and so they would be <laughs> Ill, they, they would corrode Everything, uh, they, else. They, they, everything else yeah. or, or you have uh, uh, the kind of leaders who do not understand how to determine what is the best investment to make we have you don't you know the whole concept of scarcity is that you have to make choices mm -hmm. now if you're constantly making poor quality choices <laughs> <laughs> then you're, you're, you're ruining the possibilities <laughs> for your country which therefore takes us to the center of the problem of Africa it, it is, is not that we can we cannot see yeah. the pathway of how these other countries have done it. Mm -hmm. It is simply that we are not having the right stock of leadership Just put it at the political and at the technical level Very good. to govern our country. That's it. As we just don't have the right leaders. <laughs> 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 right? Because we've got the thinkers. And even the technocrats who work in government would be able to provide, uh, they're actually every constantly churning data. When you are VP of the World Bank, you are dealing with those technocrats mm. in all these governments. And I'm sure you'll say that you met brilliant minds working for all these governments across the continent. Mm. And so the disconnect They became is, less and less, actually, they were because they were reducing. The reason they were reducing is, you know, um, there's a certain kind of talent you have and a certain kind of uh, uh, ethical as, as spectrum or e e e ethical there's rectitude There's only that you so have. much BS you can take. And you simply <laughs> say to yourself, <laughs> you know. this is a waste of my time. Yeah. So uh, what happened to Africa's public service is that it began to bleed of the top quality talents that it used to have. And that also has affected the capacity of the continent to articulate sound policies and to execute.
it optimally, right. uh, even you know the sound policies. So I mean, Dr. Toby, when we when we, it's it's it, we can see. I don't think anybody. <laughs> you don't need to look very hard to know that there's a problem. Yeah, I mean, we think we can take the next ten hours and say this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Um, but then what do we do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's, well, what uh, should we do? <laughs> we, 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 we can do a lot. Mm. Uh, because one of the things we do know is that uh, countries once lagged behind. It wasn't just us. A um, uh, number of countries today that uh, are doing better in Asia once lagged behind. Mm. They similarly faced uh, uh, those kinds of uh, conditions and situations. But I think that uh, the resolve and that, that this particular uh, uh, point that I'm making is one that I, I managed to study as part of um, a research I was doing on uh, the nexus between political uh, quality of political uh, uh, of politics mm. uh, and uh, um, the uh, performance, economic performance of countries. Mm. And in that, I was looking at what happened to, um, to Germany immediately following the, uh, the end of the Second World War, mm -hmm. when it was a heap of ruin. Mm. How did it work its way back into a, a country that could then become uh, the largest economy in Europe, the leading economy in Europe, the third largest economy in the world? Um, and it was very clear that first, the resolve of the Germans to not stay down was important. Collectively. We, under, we underestimate the power of a resolve, of a resolute mind. Mm. Now, in, you know, we, we, we look around Africa. The citizens have to say to themselves, this is not enough. This is, you know, we want more. Mm. This cannot be our destiny. It is not the destiny of our continent to be laggard. Mm. So the collective will of the people is number one. And then the second part of it, is we have to, um, for each of the countries, diagnose what are the key uh, barriers to the emergence of this, of the kind of an environment that enables growth, mm. that facilitates growth. And when we analyze this, uh, one thing that you know was common was you, if you looked at the governance score of majority of our countries, it's in the lower, you know, we're in the wrong neighborhood. You know, mm. of of uh, of good governance, mm. and and being in the wrong neighborhood of good governance immediately says to us, where is this bad governance coming from? Yeah. And it will take you smack into political leadership, because ultimately the political leadership of a country determines the quality of technical, you know, uh, like, you know, uh, performance mm. uh, of of that country. And so, in my research, I found clearly that there's a correlation between the quality of politics of our continent and the capacity of our continent to produce good economic outcomes. Excuse me, Can teacher. I give you a perspective? Yes, excuse oh, me, sorry. teacher. Yes, yes, excuse me. So in this case of Germany, for example, as you studied, this resolute people of Germany who were determined to rise up from the ashes, so to speak, what did they do? How did they make the decision right. to select their leaders? Uh -huh. so, so part of what then happened was that at the very basic level of the communities and with the involvement of uh, uh, local institutions, uh, you know, groups and, and uh, including the churches, in, in their own case, churches, mm -hmm. uh, the mosques not, was not part of that equation at mm -hmm. the time. Um, what they did was they organized <laughs> they didn't agonize. Mm. They organized. And what they did was to organize and the concept of community governance arose as a result of that. Uh, labor was an important part of it. Mm. Uh, you know, so th those kinds of institutions that brought people together to want to solve problems uh, that were facing them commonly. This is, this is sadly not the case anymore with us. Mm. Our, our traditional African approach was often a community solving its problem. Yes. But what, with, what then happened was a divergence between that culture and this, what people consider an alien state that they do not connect to. 
so they are detached from this state uh, yeah. that is in Nairobi yeah. and they say uh, you know these people are doing their things they don't they, they I'm they just uh, going to so so that the, the, that complete the the the, <laughs> this, the coupling of the of the communities wanting good for themselves and the people who now had the power to make the laws to make the policies just really capped the capacity of Africans to stay in a resolute state at a level that could push the interest to to take their destinies in their hands so what you find is what i call lend helplessness mm. right lend helplessness people simply look at the situation and say it will never change mm. let me mind, let me my, mind business. my business and that is a terrible thing so we need to get that back and i think that in in many ways uh we're seeing in a generation of Africans who are saying we want more. Mm. Why are they saying that? Oh, they are saying that because they are looking at the rest of the world and saying, hey, this is not rocket science. Mm. We can actually, you know, participate. We can produce. We can mm. add something to, mm. to the global economy. And so that generation is not, um, they are not carrying the baggage of colonialism. They are not carrying the baggage. If you, if you tell some of our young ones that there was a time when white people were all over here mm. and the Africans were just... <laughs> bowing down. Bowing, they say, really? How could that have happened? They're like, they find it like, no. Where, where, where <laughs> you <know>? were you people? <laughs> you know, so, 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 you, so they, they are not, they are, they are not um, in any way impaired by, uh, by uh, colonialism. They, they didn't say dictatorship. <laughs> These are children born into freedom, mm. <laughs> right? And they didn't. Uh, they 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 don't like the idea that they are associated with corruption. Mm. That that is what they are known for. So these kinds of things that held back the other generations, not holding them back. So their rules of engagement are entirely different. It's very. It's an in incredible development for our continent that our children are coming to that place where they are owning their space. So that resoluteness is actually a good factor. They want more. They, they believe they deserve more. They are ready to put in the work to produce more. We must, you know, hold on to it. And then we must begin the process of cleaning up our politics. Mm. We have to clean up our politics. Currently, because of what we said previously, people just looked at um, the governance spectrum and they said, no, I don't find myself in this. Mm. And so they voted with their feet out of public sector, mm -hmm. out of public leadership, and they voted into either private sector or completely went abroad. Yeah. So when you're then left with in a situation where the most important <laughs> leadership of any people is, left to <laughs> is now left to <laughs> vagaries <laughs> of all kinds of we pay more attention to who we who, who we hire to run the grocery shop than who we elect to be uh, a it's parliamentarian to be a president mm. but that's an that's an anomaly that's an anomaly and we must fix that because if we fixed that, then what we would have is a situation where we will attract our best into public leadership at the local level, at every level of leadership. The momentum that that creates is remarkable. Consider a country like Germany was once very fragmented before someone called Bismarck came along. Mm -hmm. Italy the same. Mm -hmm. But the thing that you mentioned the glue that one sees in these developed countries is their sense of nationhood. Mm. They are Germans. Mm. You may come from this state, you may come from this state. Even small countries like Switzerland, who have their cantons, they are Swiss. Yet they are Germans, they are Italians, they are French, but they are Swiss. Swiss. Now, with us, <laughs> You are right when you say spot on. The social fabric that we adhered to somehow never matured into nationhood. Mm -hmm. And that is why even when we, th when we think about our public service, the social systems that didn't mature into nationhood are manifest. I have a position in government so that I can benefit people who come from my background. Mm -hmm. When 
I think in terms of development, I first think of my background before I think of the nation. How do we get to a point where we understand everything about nationhood so that we are actually citizens of our country? Yes, our background is not withstanding. Because so long as that isn't there, when, whenever we talk of public service of our politics, it will reflect this. Mm. We'll pay lip service to country, but our actions are mm. fragmented into those small cocoons that represent where our origins are from. Mm. Mm. You, you make a very strong point. Uh, and, um, you know, we're back again to the matter of leadership. Leadership must emerge mm. from amongst us. Mm. It, we, we, you know, Africa is not a place despoiled to the point where we can't, you know, emerge good leaders. Okay, so so it then it then behooves us to to think of it in a more deliberate way. Uh, and I've spent uh, the last uh, four or so years mm. uh, thinking of it that way uh, by looking at. What, how do you correct for this anomaly? Mm. And a, a critical uh, initiative that uh, I, I, I have embarked on with um, other colleagues of mine is uh, the establishment of schools of politics, policy, and governance across the continent. Mm -hmm. uh, we're starting gradually, but it is important that we should um, you know, disrupt uh, the current uh, pattern of emergence of leadership mm. at every level of our existence. Now, part of why that kind of a leadership preparation system is necessary is because of what you've just said. The fact that you, you have to, uh, you know, get people to understand it, there are critical pathways to mobilizing all the assets of a society. Uh, the, uh, the, the diversity doesn't have to be a disadvantage. As a matter of fact, research shows that diversity, diverse societies are more, are more advantaged in terms of rate of innovation mm -hmm. <laughs> so, than homogeneous societies. Mm -hmm. So it, it's only, you know, when we mismanage, squander our diversity that it turns into fractious, you know, factionalized spaces where collaboration and cooperation are not possible. Mm. Uh, so what, so what, 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 what we need is to spend so much more time uh, building leaders who come out with ethical, very strong ethical and moral rectitude. So it's about their character. Mm. We need to take back to the place where the leader steps out and we know this leader is not about himself mm. this leader is not about his little cocoon of people you know uh, but a leader for all all right so ethical character they are not self-serving and then we have to give them the competence mm. that they need in statecraft so they need to know the multidisciplinary issues that are important for fixing an economy, to, for taking an economy from poverty to prosperity. So whether it's knowledge of uh, uh, macro uh, issues, uh, knowledge of uh, uh, structural issues, knowledge of uh, how you build uh, the right uh, uh, human capital stock mm -hmm. and the uh, issues around the managing sustainability and uh, building resilient societies, knowledge of how you do, uh, you build state institutions, knowledge of how you, uh, you determine the kind of investments mm -hmm. and uh, the way to manage your public financial systems, they need to have that. We can't have a situation where frequently in our countries, we just, people just stumble into, into political office. They're just <laughs> Anybody. And, you're, and you're talking, and you're talking, <laughs> you're talking monetary policy, the fellow has no clue <laughs> what, what, you're, what you're saying. And you're saying, oh, well, you know, the monetary policy and the fiscal policy have to be in and they are looking at you. And they can't wait for you to just shut up. Yeah. So they tell you what to do. Yeah. And what to do on the basis of what they think that is not anchored on, you know, very sound uh, research and evidence of what works, you know? Mm. So, so uh, take, for example, uh, the matter of uh, education. The, the kind of challenge that we have now that people are not even really paying attention to is that current data says that nine out of every 10 children in Africa are not achieving minimum proficiency level <laughs> in literacy, numeracy, and social emotional skills. What? That's it. That's, that's the Nine disaster. out of 10? Nine disaster. out of 10. That's a failure. Nine out of every 10. They, by the time they are at early grade foundational level, mm. 
They are not achieving this. And who do you think are these people? They are mostly the children of the poor. Yep. So you, you correlate the children of the poor not even having an opportunity to have the basic skills. What then do you build on? What? Where do you start from? Mm. So it means that you know, we will take a longer journey to get into where we should get to mm. until we can get the good sense to say, no, leadership of a certain quality is desirable for us to make progress. If not imperative. Uh, not, well, that's, a, that's the word. I think mm. you have a better word. It's imperative. It's a, a non-negotiable mm. uh, for, for us to make progress. Uh, and that means that the citizens' resoluteness has got to. will pull them in a direction where they are saying, hey, this we need it. to have a deliberate system of leadership recruitment. Citizens. We need to. And by the way, when you talk leadership, people sometimes think, oh, one person. No, that's nonsense. You would need to build such massive stock of leaders at the base Across. in the counties. Mm. The counties should have more than 120 or even a thousand people who could lead at any point in time. The, 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 the provinces, the, the nation, uh, the, that is the national level. You have to just invest. Africa's greatest investment now that would change our story for the rest of this 21st century, which will stand a chance to claim. Africa can claim the 21st century. There is, you know, people sometimes look at it and think it's not doable. It is doable. You know, 40 years ago, no one saw China coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 30 years ago, no one saw India coming. Imagine. I am telling you, it, 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 they, nobody saw them coming, but they came. And the truth is that the possibilities for our children now, who are global players, when we give them the best opportunities, show us the pathway. How do we show and help these children to actually push back against the status quo? Because mm. the status quo is really, really fighting, and you've witnessed it, mm. right? As, as you see these younger generations coming up and saying, no, this is not it, this is not enough, we demand more, the status quo just comes back and pushes back mm -hmm. and suppresses and status quo is this entire ecosystem that has the local players and other international players mm -hmm. who are benefiting from the status mm -hmm. quo mm -hmm. how do you overcome this yes and uh, so first with humility <laughs> this our generation mm -hmm. needs to act with humility <laughs> if it if we were wonderful the children would not be complaining yeah we you know so we have to come to the table with a lot of humility saying we could have done better mm -hmm. but we did not forgive us for that however there are some intergenerational wisdom that we can both value you know benefit from mm -hmm. we need to say to them that these are the ways that we believe we made our mistakes please don't repeat them you may be angry at us but don't repeat our mistakes okay uh, and the a, a core aspect in, in, the, in the research that we did shows that even, even if we trained you for competence and we trained you for capacity and you lack character, you're still going to be a low cost mm. on the society. And it has nothing to do with age. It all has to do with the kind of corrosive mindset that sub, sub, subverts the common good. So we would tell them where these mistakes exist mm -hmm. and why they must not repeat them then we must we would give them the wisdom of saying we are available for when you need us all right because mm -hmm. the truth is they have a lot to teach us yeah <laughs> this younger generation we shouldn't just even go and be pretending we we need to you know one of the things for example that that is important because i i've watched uh, a number of times when the younger generation have tried to sort of say we want more we want different and then they they get to the point where it appears like they they are not making progress and they immediately get flustered yeah. and they feel tired and they feel worn out and they say we're not getting it well we need to tell them that life is for the long haul and they have to stay the course mm -hmm. they must stay the course they must not be easily defeated uh, because the the resilience of those who wouldn't want a better uh, as uh, africa is it should be countered 
by a much more resilient set mm. of people who want a better Africa. If those who don't want good tire you out, then what's the point, yeah. right? And then, and then uh, we need to be able to say to them that a certain level of structure mm. and organization is still important. Uh, you know, I love the idea of, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we all are collectively leading. Mm -hmm. But even when you're all collectively leading, you have to have a semblance of a way, a loose network of where your, your machinery of yeah. leadership is. The, because leadership is not just about the passion. It's about the strategic trust. It's about, you know, the choices that have to be made. It's about considerations of the consequences of each action. So the a, a sense where they are much more deliberate mm. and, and in, in organizing how they are engaging with the issues. And they must be very empirically and factually based in their approaches. They, right. You know, you, and so I love them for when they generate data. I love the data part of them and they, you know, tooling themselves with the data mm. and ensuring that their advocacy is based on that constructive engagement. Mm. You, you may not like me, but you can't argue with my points. Yeah. You can't argue with my facts. We need to get them to do that. And we need to get them to honor themselves, right? They need to honor themselves. Uh, the idea that I am the greatest shouldn't be, because that's part of the, part of the problem. Uh, one key problem that we've had mm. is this matter of I am the greatest. Mm. Therefore, every other person is relegated. Yeah. No, that's not necessary. It really isn't. But I really believe in this generation. <laughs> Very well said. We all do. CT actually really believes in them. Yeah, Obi, thank you very much. <laughs> thank for you. Us. This thank has you. been a very, very good conversation. We're looking forward to, you know, the SPPG, that is the School of Politics, Policy and Governance mm -hmm. in Nigeria. We've graduated our fourth cohort. Oh, nice. The uh, uh, SPPG Senegal will uh, started last year and mm -hmm. will be graduating its first cohort in January. And now the, your colleague, your fellow uh, Kit and Ken in Kenya are designing the SPPG uh, Kenya. Uh, to support the process of this deliberate uh, training of and preparation of leaders. You need massive stock. So we will have an SPPG in Kenya? Oh, yes. Oh, very good. Yes. Very yes. good. Fantastic. Dr. Obiageli Obi Ezekwesili. Hey, say that name. <laughs> Thank you yes. very much. Say, 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 say the name. Obiageli Obi Ezekwesili. Okay. Yes. <laughs> She's the president of Human, Human Capital Africa, senior economic advisor, Africa Economic Development Policy Initiative. She's been our guest. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day.